Welcome to this video. We are going to discuss a book written by Mary Buffett, who was the ex-wife of Peter Buffett, Warren Buffett's son, and by David Clark, a Buffettologist who took meticulous notes from master classes in Omaha, which is the hometown of Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett. This book was written to serve as a systematic and colorful guide to understand how Warren Buffett makes equity investment decisions and to understand the language of business, which is accounting. If you're looking for a guide to technical analysis or speculative investing, this is not the book or video for you. I'm sure many viewers might know some accounting and they also might know how to read financial statements. Um, but in this video, we are really gonna focus on how and why Warren focuses on certain aspects of financial statement analysis and certain accounting concepts. For anyone new to financial statement analysis, please be prepare prepared to watch this video more than once and to also uh, consult other sources to complement your learnings. Accounting is the language of business, and it's an imperfect language, but unless you are willing to put in the effort to learn accounting, which is how to read and interpret financial statements, you really shouldn't select stocks yourself. Warren Buffett. At its heart, the Warren Buffett style of investing is about improving the methods of his mentor, Benjamin Graham. The two key themes that distinguish the style of investing from Benjamin Graham's are 1. How do you identify an exceptional company with a durable competitive advantage? And how do you value a company with a durable competitive advantage? These companies own a piece of the consumer's minds and therefore they do not have to change its products or service offerings. And Warren Buffett developed a set of analytical tools to identify these special types of businesses. First, they sell a unique product. These companies own a piece of the consumer's mind and therefore it can charge higher prices and sell more of its products because it never has to change its products. Some examples include Budweiser, Pepsi, and Coca-Cola. They sell a unique service. Companies that sell a unique service are institutional specific as opposed to people specific. They do not have to spend a lot of money on redesigning its products nor do they need to spend a lot of resources building production plants or warehousing. And examples include H&R Block, the taxation company, and American Express, the credit card company. They are a low-cost buyer and seller of a product or service that the public consistently needs. And it allows these companies to get their margins higher than their competitors and still be the low-cost seller of a product or service. Examples of these types of companies include Walmart or Costco. These companies have monopoly-like economics that give them a long-term competitive advantage. Moreover, the underlying economics of these businesses diminished his risk while increasing his potential for gain. We know that his book is truly about how Warren assesses a company's financial statements. So he asks the following questions. Does it show consistent earnings? Does it consistently not have to spend large sums on research and development? Does it show consistent growth in earnings? Does it consistently have high gross margins? And does it consistently carry little or no debt? Financial statements are where Warren Buffett mines for companies with the golden durable competitive advantage. The financial statements are a record of the financial activities of a business. The financial statements tell him if he is looking at a mediocre business or a company that has a durable competitive advantage that will bring him exceptional returns. The three key financial statements are the balance sheet, the income statement, and the statement of cash flows. The balance sheet is a statement of financial position. The balance sheet reports the company's resources or its assets, how these resources were funded or its liabilities and shareholder equity on a particular date, which could be the end of a quarter or the end of a year. So it's a point estimate. The income statement illustrates the operating performance of a company. It is a statement of profit or loss over a specific period of time, typically a quarter or a year. Along with the balance sheet and income statement, the cash flow statement is a required financial statement that provides insight that the in income statement cannot. Specifically, it tells us exactly how much cash a company generates and from which activities. We also need to know where to find financial statements and the book 
gives us some directions as well. The Securities and Exchange Commission is a United States federal agency which was established by the U.S. Congress in 1934 whose mission is to protect investors and maintain the integrity of the securities markets, which includes the establishment and maintenance of accounting principles and regulations. All public companies in the U.S. must file per periodic reports with the SEC, or Securities and Exchange Commission. Only through the steady flow of timely, comprehensive, and accurate information can investors make sound investment decisions. And these filings can also be found on the SEC's website, uh, which is the sec.gov. And for filings in other countries, there are some specific platforms that are similar to the SEC, but a little less comprehensive, and they may also have a fee. Examples include for the UK, it's the companieshouse.gov.uk, and Canada is the cedar.com. In addition, you can usually find recent company filings on company websites, and that's usually in the investor relations sections, or data services such that are free uh, include a Yahoo Finance or Google Finance, and there are others with subscriptions, which include Capital IQ, Thomson, FactSet, Bloomberg, or Morningstar. The Form 10K. This is the primary document for company data. And at the end of the each fiscal year, publicly traded companies must file a report called a 10K, which is a detailed overview of their businesses and includes their financial statements. A 10K will usually contain details regarding financial information such as stock options, fixed and intangible assets, debt, and future expectations, and include extensive management discussions and analysis, also known as MD&A. The 10K also includes non-financial information, such as strategic direction from the CEO, the chairman, the corporate profile, further MD&A or management discussion and analysis, and risk control processes and analysis. And these are generally filed within 60 to 90 days following the year end. At the end of each quarter of their fiscal year, publicly traded companies also file a 10Q report, which includes financial statements and non-financial data that usually has less detailed footnotes and MD&A than the 10K. The 10Qs must also be filed within 40 to 45 days of the quarter end. And you'll often hear of earnings calls which generally refer to the 10 Qs. There are other important filings that the companies must file, which include the 8K or the 14A, which is a proxy, or the 20F, and so forth, but the book didn't go into any details about it, so I won't cover it here. You have to read a zillion corporate annual reports and their financial statements. Warren Buffett. Warren starts his analysis with the income statement. At a high level, the income statement is a revenue less expenses generated to equal profitability or loss. It's very simple. The income statement facilitates the analysis of a company's growth prospects, cost structure, and the components and drivers of net earnings. The first line is the revenue or gross income. To Warren, the source of the earnings is much more important than the revenue itself. Not all income is revenue. And revenue by itself also doesn't tell us very much, which is why he looks at what the company had to spend to earn that revenue. Expenses, also known as cost of goods sold, or COGS, or cost of sales, or cost of revenue for a service-based business, represents a company's direct cost to manufacture for manufacturers or to procure for merchandisers of a good or service. Direct costs can include raw materials such as steel or lumber, uh, direct labor costs, and factory overhead, and so forth. It's very important to understand that the COGS do not include administrative costs. This includes such things as corporate overhead, marketing and administrative expenses, research and development, and salaries of, of employees that are not associated directly with the product or service. And these costs are usually included under this SGNA or selling general and administrative expenses or other line items that we'll discuss in, in a little bit. But still, COGS or cost of goods sold by itself doesn't tell us very much either. The gross profit represents profit only after direct expenses for the COGS have been subtracted from revenues. The gross profit margin tells Warren about the economics of the company. 
The companies that have a durable competitive advantage have consistently higher gross margins, and in general, companies with a gross profit margin of 40% or better have some sort of durable competitive advantage. If it were only so simple. But after gross profit margins considered, we have other expenses, commonly known as operating expenses. And these are indirect operating expenses that include things like the SG&A, the research and development or R&D, depreciation and amortization, impairment charges, and so forth. Warren scrutinizes these operating expenses very carefully. SG&A are operating expenses that are not directly associated with the production or procurement of the product or service that the company is selling to generate revenue. So this includes things like management salaries, payroll, wages, commissions, meals and travel expenses, stationery, advertising, and marketing expenses. Warren looks for companies with consistently low spending on SG&A. As a percentage of gross profit, SG&A spending under 30% is considered good. Companies that do not have a durable competitive advantage have wide variations in their SG&A. In general, Warren stays away from companies with high SG&A expenses. Warren also stays away from companies with high R&D expenses. R&D are a company's activities that are directed at developing new products or procedures. The competitive advantage for companies with high R&D expenses are usually because of a patent or a technological advancement. So that means when the patent goes away, so does the competitive advantage, as in the case for many pharmaceutical companies or tech companies. For example, Merck, which is a pharmaceutical company, spends approximately 30% of its gross profit on R&D and 49% on SG&A for a total of 78% of its gross profit in these operating expenses. This is a little hard to swallow, but Warren thinks companies that have to spend so much on these indirect operating costs have an inherent flaw in their competitive, competitive advantage and long-term economics. You must have heard of the acronym EBITDA. The EBITDA is the earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, which is the gross profit subtracted by the SG&A and you subtract out the R&D. The EBITDA is a popular measure of a company's financial performance which Warren does not like because he believes depreciation and amortization are very real expenses, which we'll see next. Machines and buildings all have finite lifespans and eventually need to be replaced. Depreciation and amortization is the systematic allocation of costs of a fixed asset over their estimated useful life. And there's more than one method to calculate depreciation, but I'll give an example using the straight line method. For example, a magazine company purchases a printer for $100,000 with a lifespan of 10 years and a scrap value of $1,000. What is the depreciation expense that the company reports on its income statement each year? The depreciation expense is calculated by taking the purchase price, $100,000, deducting the scrap value, which is $1,000, and dividing the difference by 10 years. This gives us a depreciation expense of $9,900 a year. All of this means that the full expense for the printer is not taken in the year that it is bought, but rather is allocated in $9,900 increments over 10 years. Warren believes that depreciation should always be used in the calculation of earnings. Warren favors companies with depreciation expenses under 10% of gross profit. The interest expense is the amount the company has to pay on debt it carries on the balance sheet as a liability. This could be to bondholders or to banks. And however, sometimes the company could possibly have earned interest income, such as the company's income from its cash holdings and investments in stocks, bonds, and savings accounts. The interest expense is a financial cost and not an operating expense because it reflects the debt that a company carries. And so what does Warren think about interest expense? Companies with a long-term durable competitive advantage carry little to no interest expense. Typical interest expense ratios vary depending on the industry, so you'll need to do your homework on that. The authors gave an important example in the book. In 2006, an investment company named Bear Stearns reported that it paid 70% of its operating income on interest payments. 
and by November 2007, that number rose to 230%. The company went from $170 a share to $10 per share when it merged with J.P. Morgan Chase and Company. Companies also have to report infrequent income and expenses, such as the gain or loss, and it could be on the sale of an asset other than inventory or the disposal of a business segment. A profit is the difference between the proceeds from the sale and the carrying amount on the company's books. This other line item could be things like licensing agreements, the sale of patents, impairment charges, write-offs, or restructuring costs. These unusual or infrequent items pose a challenge for when we are doing financial statement analysis because management teams can decide how to classify operating items or they might not clearly label unusual or infrequent items. And that means these other expenses could be shown as separate items on the income statement if they're material, such as the gain on a sale of assets, or they could be buried within operating items. All of these challenges create potential for manipulation and accounting shenanigans. So to keep it simple, remove these infrequent or unusual events from the net earnings for a truer picture of what is happening at the company. The earnings before tax or EBT is an important number to use to compare different investments. Warren discusses earnings of a company in pre-tax terms for this reason. The average income tax for a corporation is around 35% in the United States. So looking at the amount of income tax paid is a great way to see if a company is actually making money that they report. All we need to do is take the earnings before tax, the EBT, and deduct 35%. If the tax paid on the income statement is vastly different, start asking questions. Net income is an important indicator for a company with a durable competitive advantage. A ratio to look at is the net income divided by the total revenue. The higher the percentage, the better because it can tell us a lot about the economics of the business compared to other businesses. A low net income to total revenue ratio can mean that the company is in a highly competitive industry. Warren's rule of thumb is to look for a 20% ratio for net income to total revenue. The earnings per share is net income divided by the shares outstanding. However, it isn't enough to take the earnings per share for one year. Warren looks at the EPS for a 10 year period to see if a company has a durable competitive advantage. The 10 year trend should be on an upward trend and should be consistent. Erratic changes, booms and busts create an illusion of buying opportunities. Beware. One of the things that you will find, which is interesting and people don't think enough of, is with most businesses and with most individuals, is life tends to snap you at your weakest link. The two biggest weakest links in my experience, I've seen more people fail because of liquor and of leverage. Leverage being borrowed money, Warren Buffett. The balance sheet shows a company's resources, which is its assets, and how those resources were funded which is liabilities and shareholders equity on a particular date, which is, it could be the end of the year, for example. Think of the balance sheet like a point estimate or a snapshot of a point in time. This is the famous accounting equation. Assets equal liabilities plus shareholders equity. And it's a balance sheet because it needs to balance. This is why we do double entry accounting when developing a balance sheet. The authors didn't review that in the book, so I'll also leave it out. There are many different kinds of assets, which are divided into current assets, which means it can be convert converted into cash within 12 months, or non-current assets, which, are, which would take greater than one year. Current assets can be turned into cash quite e easily and are things like cash and marketable securities, accounts receivable, inventories, and prepaid expenses. These are listed on the balance sheet in order of liquidity, so from highest liquidity to the least. Current assets are also known as the working assets because it illustrates the cash inventories and accounts receivable cash cycle. Look for companies where the inventory and cash are increasing together. Cash or cash equivalent, such as the three-month treasuries or a short-term cash deposit, are highly liquid assets. 
Lots of cash can mean that the company is generating cash through its businesses or that it recently sold a business unit or, or sold bonds, for example. Long-term or non-current assets cannot be converted into cash during the year. These are things like long-term investments, property, plant and equipment, intangible assets and goodwill, non-physical assets such as patents, trademarks and goodwill are acquired by the, by the company that have value based on the rights belonging to that company. An important thing to note is that most balance sheet items are listed at their historical or acqu acquisition costs, known as their book value. This prevents assets from being overstated um, and is an example of conservatism. Cash or cash equivalents such as three-month treasuries or short-term CDs are highly liquid assets, as we already talked about. Lots of cash can mean the company is generating cash through its businesses or that it recently sold a business unit. Companies use excess cash to expand its business operations, acquire new companies, invest in shares of other companies, they can buy back their stocks, or pay cash dividends to its shareholders, or they can even save it. The three basic ways to create a large stockpile of cash are, one, sell new corporate bonds or issue equity to the public, two, sell an existing business or asset, or three, generate excess cash through its ongoing business. When Warren analyzes the business with excess cash and little debt, he bets that the company can withstand any short-term troubles, but only if he sees it generating cash through its ongoing business operations. So as a reminder again, current assets are assets that are expected to be converted into cash in less than one year. Current liabilities are any amount due to be paid to a creditor in less than one year. A non-current asset is any asset that is expected to be held for more than one year, and a non-current liability is any obligation that is not due to be paid within one year, and we'll speak about liabilities uh, coming up. The current ratios gauge the ability of a company to cover short-term financing needs, and it's the current ratio equals current assets divided by current liabilities. A rough rule of thumb is a current ratio greater than one is thought to be good. That implies that there are more liquid assets than short-term liabilities, which are re uh, reflecting a healthier level of liquidity. However, many companies with a durable competitive advantage can have a current ratio less than one. It's because of their great earning power, they can pay back dividends and buy back their stock, which can lower their cash reserves and decrease their current ratio. So just be on the lookout for that. Warren is not a fan of PP&E. Any new purchases of PP&E are capital expenditures that decrease cash. PP&E or property, plants, and equipment represent land, buildings, and machinery used in the manufacturing of the company's services and products, plus all the costs, which in can include transportation, installation, etc., necessary to prepare those fixed assets for their service. The PP&E cycles out of the balance sheet and into the income statement as depreciation, either in the COGS or the SGNA or elsewhere. So when a company doesn't have a long-term competitive advantage, it usually has to make capital expenditures to stay competitive in its industry, and they usually have to access debt financing to pay for it. For companies that acquire other companies, goodwill can become a sizable asset on the balance sheet. Goodwill is the amount by which the purchase price for a company exceeds its fair market value, representing the intangible value arising from the acquired company's business name, customer relations, employee morale, and product potential. Goodwill is created only if the purchase price exceeds the book value of all the assets acquired. And sometimes, if the value of a previously acquired company declines, Goodwill is recorded as an impairment charge on the balance sheet. The goodwill write-downs imply that a company overpaid in, an, in the original acquisition. Here's an example. Gilead acquires Pharmacet in 2011 for 11 billion US dollars. The book value for Pharmacet was 172 million dollars in 2011. Gilead believed that because of the market potential of sofosfavir to treat hepatitis C, Pharmacet's fair market value is much likely higher and thus decided to acquire or negotiated to acquire Pharmacet for $11 billion, which is 
10.828 billion above the book value for Pharmacet. And that 10.828 billion paid above the book value is recorded as goodwill on Gilead's balance sheet. Intangible assets are comprised of non-physical acquired assets, meaning the asset must be acquired and not internally developed. And types of intangible assets can include customer lists, franchises, memberships, licenses, patents and technology, trademarks, copyrights, and goodwill. Intangible assets are reduced on the balance sheet via an amortization expense on the income statement. Coca-Cola's brand is worth billions, but it is not recorded on the balance sheet because it was internally developed. So remember this, companies with a durable competitive advantage often have their greatest asset absent from their balance sheet. Their brand is worth billions because so many millions are addicted to sugar, but that's for another day and not for this um, book review. Well, we need to ensure the company is putting its assets to efficient use, uh, so we calculate the return on total assets. The return on total assets is the net earnings divided by the total assets. So at the time of writing this book, Coca-Cola had $43 billion in assets and a return on total assets of 12%. Moody's uh, had a $1.7 billion in assets and a return on total assets of 43%. Warren argued that it would be much easier to raise $1.7 billion to acquire Moody's versus the, versus the $43 billion to acquire Coca-Cola. The durability of Moody's competitive advantage is much weaker than Coca-Cola because of the lower cost of entry into the business though. Remember the accounting equation that assets must equal liabilities plus shareholders equity. Liabilities are also divided into current liabilities, as we talked about earlier, uh, which is less than one year, and non-current liabilities, which is to be paid back after one year, uh, which is just similar to the current and non-current assets. So to put it simply, the liabilities and shareholders' equity represent the company's sources of funds, which is how it pays for its assets. So the liabilities represent what the company owes to others, and they must be measurable, and their occurrence uh, is probable, and the equity represents sources of funds through equity investments and retain earnings. The retain earnings are what the company has earned through operations since it started. So the current liabilities include accounts payable, accrued expenses, for example, employee salaries, short-term debt, which is due in 12 months, any deferred revenues. Uh, and long-term or non-current liabilities include long-term debt or capital leases. The long-term debt simply is whose maturity exceeds 12 months. And the shareholders or owner's equity includes preferred stock, common stock, treasury stock, retained earnings, and other comprehensive income that includes gains and losses from foreign currency translations or unrealized gains um, on available for sales securities and so forth. So any change in assets or liabilities or shareholders equity is accompanied by an offsetting change that keeps the balance sheet well in balance. On the balance sheet, liabilities are presented in order of when they are to be paid. So liabilities like short-term debt and accounts payables are to be paid within 12 months and are labeled current. Any portion of the long-term debt due within one year is also listed under short-term debt line item. Long-term liabilities, such as long-term debt, is not included within the year and it can also be a sizable liability. So Warren carefully scrutinizes just how much short-term and long-term debt a company has. He shies away from companies with a higher short-term to long-term debt ratio. Companies with a durable competitive advantage require little to no long-term debt. They are self-financing from their business operations. Warren reviews just how much long-term debt load they have had for the past 10 years. Companies with a durable competitive advantage have enough earnings to pay off all their long-term debt within three to four years. A minority interest is ownership or interest of less than 50% of an enterprise. The this term can refer to either stock ownership or partnership interest in a company. So minority interests are the portion of a company or stock that is not held by the parent company, which has a majority interest. Most minority interests range between 20 to 30% and it shows up as a liability on the balance sheet. This line item doesn't, 
doesn't help much with identifying a company with a durable competitive advantage, but it's still important to know what this line item means. Solvency ratios are measures of a firm's ability to repay its debt obligations. The debt to uh, shareholders equity ratios help to identify whether a company is using debt to finance its operations. The debt to equity ratio is the total liabilities divided by the shareholders equity. So we would want to see a company with a high shareholders equity and low total liabilities. But sometimes this ratio can be misleading. For example, a company with a durable competitive advantage could be buying back its stock, which would effectively lower its shareholders equity because it's using its retained earnings and increasing the debt to equity ratio. So Warren prefers to add back in any treasury stock that the company acquired through stock buybacks before calculating this ratio. And a company with a debt to equity ratio of 0.65 means that for every dollar of equity, the company has 65 cents of debt. And a ratio of 38 means that for every dollar of equity, the company has $38 of debt. Rearranging the accounting equation, assets minus liabilities equals shareholders equity. And equity represents sources of funds through equity investments, uh, which is preferred stocks, common stocks, or treasury stocks, and retained earnings. So let's review each of these equity types in detail. So first you have preferred stock. Preferred stock are stock that has special rights to a dividend that takes priority over common stock owners, and they do not have voting rights. Companies with a durable competitive advantage do not tend to have preferred stock because they have little debt, which, meaning, which means they're self-financing. And also, dividends that are paid out are not deductible, like the interest on debt, which really makes this expensive money. Put another way, most businesses don't issue preferred stock because these are viewed as debt with a tax disadvantage, and dividends do not reduce taxable income. Then you have common stock. Common stock represents capital received by a company when it issues shares. So and it allows for participation in the profits of the company in the form of dividends. It also represents ownership and voting rights. So one vote is for every share that you hold. And if the company dissolves, any residual amount after everyone else is paid would go to the common shareholders. Next comes treasury stock. This is what a company buys back as common stock. The company can either cancel them or it can hold them with the possibility of reissuing these stock later on, which is what we call a treasury stock. So companies that have a durable competitive advantage have treasury stock or have bought back their shares. And finally, we have retained earnings. The company's net earnings can either be retained, it can be used to pay out dividends, or it can be used to buy back shares. Warren retains 100% of Berkshire Hathaway's net earnings. A company's retained earnings is an accumulated number from all the prior years. And if a company is not adding to its retained earnings, it's not growing its net worth. So if the rate of a company's retained earnings is a good indicator that the company is benefiting from its durable competitive advantage. And a company can re increase its retained earnings from its business operations or through the acquisition of other good businesses. And Warren himself would use his retained earnings to acquire other businesses to increase the retained earnings. But it has to keep buying other companies with a durable competitive advantage as well. And that is how Warren has made his billions. A return on equity ratio is the net income divided by the total equity. So when a company buys back its stock and retains the shares as treasury stocks, it lowers the shareholders equity, but effectively increases the return on equity. Such as when a company reports a high return on equity, look for evidence of financial engineering, such as the presence of treasury stock, or if there really is excellent business economics. A company with a durable competitive advantage, they tend to have excellent return on equity ratios. And over time, this value is reflected through an increase in the company's stock price. And if you remember, we talked about the return on total assets. One of the primary challenges with the return on total assets is that it mixes a levered measure of profitability with an unlevered measure of assets. Remember, assets can be financed with or without leverage, and net income is sensitive to leverage because we deduct the interest expenses. So therefore, the return on total assets isn't the best ratio to use when comparing different companies 
with slightly different rates of leverage. So the return on equity solves this challenge by factoring out the leverage in the denominator and it calculates a return on just the equity value of the firm. And this facilitates the analysis across companies with varying degrees of leverage. So essentially, the return on equity is a test of the management's efficiency in allocating the shareholders' money. There is a huge difference between the business that grows and requires a lot of capital to do so and the business that grows and doesn't require capital. The final financial statement we will talk about is the cash flow statement. If you remember that we stated earlier, Warren believes cash is king. The cash flow statement in provides insight that the income statement cannot because it tells us exactly how much cash a company generates and from which activities. Most companies use an accrual method of accounting. Accrual accounting is one of the most important concepts in accounting and it governs the company's timing in recording its revenues and associated expenses. So revenue recognition is really an accrual basis of accounting that dictates that revenues must be recorded when uh, it is earned and measurable. On the other hand, the matching principle is that costs associated with making a product must be recorded during the same period as revenue generated uh, from that product. So while accrual accounting has its benefit, it kind of makes it difficult to track objectively the movement of cash via only the income statement or the balance sheet, and hence, which is why we need a cash flow statement. The cash flow statement effectively rec reconciles the net income to a company's actual change in cash from the opening balance, all the cash transactions, and the closing cash balance over a period of time, such as a quarter or a year. So along with the balance sheet and the income statement, the cash flow statement is a required financial statement and it pro provides the insight that the income statement cannot. Namely, it tells us exactly how much cash a company generates and from which activities and the cash transactions are sorted by activity type. This is broken down into three sections. The cash from operations, which is how much cash did the company generate from operations during that period, and it uses net income as a starting point and converts accrual-based net income into cash flow from operations via a series of adjustments, such as non-cash and accrual. Then we have cash from investing op activities, and this could be capital expenditures or asset sales and purchases. And finally, we have financing, cash from financing activities, which could be any new borrowings or paying down of debt, any new issuing of, of stocks or share repurchases, and the issuance of dividends. Net income is the starting point of the cash flow statement. And when using something called the indirect method, which we won't get into, the next line in a cash flow statement is to add back non-cash depreciation and amortization expenses, which is embedded in the cost of goods sold and operating expenses on the income statement, thus reducing the net income. And just a flashback of the income statement to see that the amortization and depreciation are factored into the operating profit. The operating cash flows represent the operating lifeblood of business after paying the necessary outgoings for financing and tax. The cash flows from investing section simply tracks additions and reductions to fixed assets and investments during the year and it corresponds primarily to the long-term asset side of the balance sheet. So the most common investing inflows and outflows could be um, the capital expenditures which is a cash outflow and capital expenditures are always listed as a negative number because this causes a depletion, de depletion of cash. Rather. And companies must invest in some sort of property, plant, and equipment to maintain their productive capacity. But a, a, down, a downward trend could indicate a declining company. So identify the necessary level of expenditures. And other investing cash flow items could be the purchase of intangible assets or acquisitions, which would be a cash outflow, asset sales, which, be, which could be a cash inflow, and the purchase and sales of debt equity and equity securities, which could be a cash inflow or outflow. And Warren looks for companies that have low capital expenditures, as we previously talked about. And some companies must make heavy, heavy capital expenditures each year to stay in business. But remember, companies with a durable competitive advantage tend to have lower capital expenditures. 
So Warren reviews the net income to the capital expenditures using a simple ratio of net income divided by the capital expenditures. He looks at the ratios for a 10 year period and not only one year. A company using 25% or less uh, cap, uh, capital expenditures based on net income is a company that likely has a durable competitive advantage. As we previously touched on, the treasury stocks are shares that were once issued but then subsequently repurchased by the company. And companies with a durable competitive advantage often repurchase their stock instead of issuing dividends because shareholders pay tax on dividends. So this usually leads to a boost in the earnings per share, uh, meaning a repurchase of shares reduces to the total shares outstanding, or to change the company's capital structure, which is more debt and less equity. And when a company repurchases its shares, it either goes to the open market and buys them at the current share price or through a negotiation with uh, specific shareholders. And as we see here, the basic shares outstanding equals the total shares that are issued minus the shares that are repurchased, which is the treasury stock. The basic earnings per share is net income divided by the basic weighted average shares outstanding. It's a very common way that investors analyze company profits. It's by dividing the net income by the shares outstanding. And this net metric is called the earnings per share or the EPS. The earnings per share effectively measures how much of the total current period profits belong to each shareholder. And Warren likes to see their EPS increase. Basically to find out if a company is buying back its shares, go to the cash flow statement and look under cash from investing and see if there's a line item there uh, called retirement of stock. The cash flow from financing section of the cash flow statement tracks changes in the company's sources of debt and equity financing, which corresponds primarily to the liabilities and shareholders' equity side of the balance sheet. And, and the most common financing inflows or outflows are a payment of common and preferred dividends, which would be a cash outflow, common stock issued or repurchased, which be it would be a cash inflow or outflow, respectively. And if the company issues bonds or shared, cash would flow in. An issuance of debt would be a cash inflow. A repayment of debt would be a cash outflow. And if the company buys back shares or bonds, it would be a cash outflow. I look for businesses in which I think I can predict what they are going to look like in 10 to 15 years. Warren Buffett. Companies with a durable competitive advantage have such predictable earnings that their shares act almost like an equity bond with an increase in coupon payment. A bond equals the company's shares. A coupon payment would equal the pre-tax earnings of the business. So regardless of whether Warren is purchasing an entire business or only some of its shares, he looks at the pre-tax earnings, the EBT, to see if it's a good deal relative to its business economics. And then the per, per share earnings rise over time, either through an increased business operations, an expansion of operations, acquisitions, or share buybacks. In the late 1980s, Warren purchased shares for $6.50, which pre-tax earnings were a 70 cents a share rate of 10%. So disclaimer, if you're a Graham value investor, Warren's not saying that, that Coca-Cola is worth $60 and trading at $40 and is thus undervalued. To Warren, this particular investment is a dream because over the years, his initial investment will compound. In 1987, Warren started buying shares of Coca-Cola for the average price of $6.50 against a pre-tax earning of $0.70 cents and an after-tax earning of $0.46 cents per share. So Warren decided that his equity bond paid an initial pre-tax interest rates of 10.7%, which is really 0.7 cents divided by $6.50 on a $6.50 investment. So if he projected out the earnings of 10% annually, by the end of 1996, the pre-tax earnings per share was $1.65. And this equates to a pre-tax return of 25% in 10 years. But after 20 years, the pre-tax earnings per share of 4.28, which was a 66% pre-tax return, if you did divide $4.28 by $6.50. So the stock market sees this return over time and revalues the share price to reflect this. 
So to calculate the share price, we divide the pre-tax earnings per share by the corporate interest rate. So in 2007, the pre-tax earnings per share was $3.96 per share for Coca-Cola, and the corporate interest rate was 6.5%. So this gives a share price of $60. And during 2007, the market valued Coca-Cola between $45 and $64 per share. And because earnings are consistent, the stock market tracks an increase in the underlying value of the company. And as a consequence, however, the companies are vulnerable to a leveraged buyout. As a leveraged buyout is when a company carries a little debt, has a strong earnings history, and if its stock price falls low enough, another company can come in and buy it by financing the purchase with the acquirer's company's earnings as collateral. So if the interest rates drop, the company's earnings are worth much more because it can support that debt. And the inverse is true when interest rates rise. And if that's confusing, here's an easier way to understand a leveraged buyout. I won't belabor too much, but if you bought a house with a mortgage, you've essentially done a leveraged buyout. So suppose you buy a $1 million house with a $600,000 mortgage and $400,000 of equity. You've effectively bought a house with 40% equity and 60% debt. And if you sell that home for $1.5 million five years later, and assuming you've paid down $200,000 of your mortgage within that five years, and the house price increased by 50%, then your cash on cash return is 2.75 times. Your equity increased from $400,000 to 1.1 million. We're on the home stretch here, but we can't really talk about the Warren Buffett style of investing without discussing intrinsic value. What was a pre-tax 66% return on a $6.50 equity bond in 2007 worth in 1987? Remember the time value of money? A dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow? So to figure out this problem, he had to calculate Coca-Cola's intrinsic value. The intrinsic value of a stock is its real value. First, calculate the discounted cash flows for 20 years. Total the discounted cash flows to calculate the present value for the 20 years. Then calculate the intrinsic value per share. And then compare the intrinsic value per share with the current share price. In the book, the authors barely explained intrinsic value. That's a disclaimer. So I will review intrinsic value calculation in future videos when I review some of Aswat de Modoran's books. Uh, but for now, let's just review how the authors did it. So remember, Warren is asking what was the pre-tax 66% return on a $6.50 equity bond in 2007 worth in 1987. So they multiplied the share price by a discount rate of 17% to come to a $1.10 share price in 1987. And that discount rate of 17% is really a judgment call. Then they multiplied that $1.10 by Coca-Cola's price-to-earnings ratio of 14 in 1987 to arrive at an intrinsic value of $15.40. Warren argues that if he purchases a $6.50 share in 1987 and holds it for 20 years, its 1987 intrinsic value is $15.40. And in case you're wondering, in 2007, Coca-Cola was trading at $64 a share. It goes without saying that what you pay for your stock and the price you sell it at directly invests, affects your investments. The best time to purchase a great company is during a bear market, when you're most likely to find bargains. And generally the worst times are during the bull markets, when the price to earnings multiples are rather inflated. And Warren holds stocks as long as possible. And additionally, when you sell or receive dividends, those gains are also subject to taxation which tends to decrease your, your chances of getting rich. So it's a good idea to sell if you need the capital to purchase an even better company, which, which you can get at a great price. Another time to sell is if the company is about to lose its durable competitive advantage. And finally, bull markets are a good time to sell because the price to earnings multiples are inflated. And you can keep the cash or buy government bonds until the next bear market. So let's do a recap of Warren's pearls of wisdom from this book. Financial statement analysis is like detective work. It takes a critical eye to notice financial shenanigans. 
Companies that have a durable competitive advantage have consistently higher gross margins. These companies own a piece of the consumer's minds and therefore they do not have to change its products or service offerings. Companies that do not have a durable competitive advantage have wide variations in their SGNA. However, under 30% is what we're looking for. Companies that have to spend large amounts of money on indirect operating costs have an inherent flaw in their competitive advantage and long-term economics. Depreciation should always be used in the calculation of earnings. EBITDA is a short-term delusion. Do not include infrequent or unusual events from the net earnings for a truer picture of what is happening at the company. The 10-year earnings per share should be on an upward trend and should be consistent. A business with excess cash can likely withstand short-term troubles if it is generating cash through its ongoing business operations. Look for companies where the inventory and cash are increasing together. Property, plant and equipment are capital expenditures that decrease cash. Review the total assets to assess how hard it would be for a competitor to enter the business. Companies with a durable competitive advantage require little to no long-term debt. Look for a current ratio greater than one, but because of their great earning power, they can pay out dividends and buy back their stock, which could lower their cash reserves and decrease the current ratio, so just beware. Companies with a durable competitive advantage have enough earnings to pay off all the long-term debt in three to four years. An adjusted debt to equity ratio of 0.8 or less is likely to have a durable competitive advantage. Companies with a durable competitive advantage do not tend to have preferred stock, but they do tend to have treasury stock. Great companies use their retained earnings to acquire other businesses to further increase their retained earnings. Companies with a durable competitive advantage have excellent return on equity ratios, which is reflected through an increase in the company's stock price. A company using 25% or less for capital expenditures based on net income, then the company likely has a competitive advantage. Regardless of whether Warren is purchasing an entire business or only some of its shares, he looks at the pre-tax earnings, the EBT, to see if it is a good deal relative to its business economics. Purchase stocks during bear market bargains and sell the company when it's about to lose its durable competitive advantage. Sell stocks during bull markets when price to earnings multiples are inflated way beyond its intrinsic value. And price to earning multiples greater than 40 might be the time to sell a stock. This video ended up being way longer than I expected, but I definitely think it was worth it. I highly recommend for you not to read this book, but to study this book if you're interested in Warren Buffett's style of investing, or if you would also like a just a simple accounting primer. If you like this video, please click the like button, leave a comment, share this video, and subscribe to my channel. If you're a subscriber, click the bell icon if you'd like to be notified of new video uploads. I do plan to upload at least once a week, and I have an amazing uh, re list of reviews and summaries coming up. So remember, leaders are readers and you are a leader.